Welcome to Open Minds Radio with Alejandro Rojas. Open Minds Radio is your UFO news authority, presenting evidence and the latest news regarding the UFO phenomenon. Here's your host, Alejandro Rojas. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Open Minds Radio, your UFO news authority. As Mr. Dean just told you, this is Alejandro, and we have another astonishingly wonderful show today. This is going to be a great one. One of my favorite ufologists, in fact, one of my colleagues here teases me because uh, I like this guy uh, so much, but not, you know, in a, in a way that would be um, uncomfortable, I think, for either of us. But uh, Richard Dolan is our guest today. He's a big favorite of a lot of people because he's written the UFOs and the National Security State books, which is chronicling really the contemporary uh, UFO studies in a very thorough and and accurate and really kind of in a bold way. He's doing what others hadn't done before. There's a lot of people who wrote some great books about UFOs and the history, but they've kind of either stuck to nuts and bolts or they've stuck to uh, maybe less so. He's really including everything, even some of the uncomfortable type of things that happen, uh, the real unknowns. And one thing that I love about Rich is that he's not afraid to say, I don't know. Um, you know, if he doesn't know the answer to something, he'll still cover it. Uh, and that's what we like to do as well here at Open Minds. Cover everything so you can get all the information and you decide yourself. Really, it's not our job um, as researchers or journalists to make up your mind for you. So Rich is great that way. And he's also just a great speaker. He's very articulate. He's one of the great minds in the field right now, I feel. And we've had on Bryce Zabel recently. We've had him on a couple times, but uh, we've had him on since he's had After Disclosure, the book out that he co-wrote with Richard Dolan. But we have had Dolan on to talk about that book. And I'm really excited to talk to him about this because this has been one of my favorite topics, actually, with Dolan over the years. In fact, my first interview, I really tried to hone in and focus on the different types. What does disclosure mean? People talk about disclosure, but what are it's much more complicated than just, you know, the president coming and saying, hey, guess what? There's UFOs out there and aliens and have a nice day. It's much more comp- complicated than that. What's he going to say? Uh, w- what are the effects? How should we feel? And as UFO researchers, you know, what or believers, you know, or people who have looked into this, what should we be aware of? I mean, are we going to believe what they tell us? Uh, somebody said it, I think, in our chat last week. Uh, do you... Do you take the word of a pathological liar? So if they tell us something, are they going to tell us the truth? There's a lot to think about, and that's what they tackle with this book, and they do a great job with it. So we're going to talk to Richard about that. We're going to talk to him about the upcoming UFO Congress and the third National Security State book. His his last one went up into the 90s, and he's got to finish it off and bring it up into modern times, and that's what he's working on now. So we'll find out when he's going to get that done. So we've got a lot to talk about with Mr. Mr. Richard Dolan, and it's going to be a lot of fun when we get him on the air. It always is. But a little bit of Open Minds news. First, about the UFO Congress. It's doing spectacular. We've actually sold out the second hotel, and we've gotten a third, and that's the Holiday Inn. So if you haven't booked your room, Call the Holiday Inn. They'll have some special pricing for you there. And in fact, we're going to have a special guest next week. Maureen Ellsbury is going to be on to answer some questions about the UFO Congress and how that's been going. If you've called in to register, she is a person that you've talked to. And uh, hopefully she treated you very nicely. She probably did. If not, you know, send us an email and we'll make sure and put that in her personnel file. And scold her for that. No, she's great, and I'm sure you've all had a wonderful experience dealing with her, as people usually do. So the Congress, this is gonna, this is so exciting, because really, I think it's gonna be the biggest. I am saying this. I'm going on the record right now that it might be the biggest conference in the United States in on this matter uh, ever. 
because it's going to be huge. Usually the Congress gets a, a little bigger each year, and uh, it's getting bigger this year. We were worried about the economy and everything, but and a couple of uh, conferences unfortunately didn't happen because of the economy and everything. But uh, things are going so well, we're having an overwhelming response, and we're the host hotel, we're going to be taking over every single room there, and uh, now we're going to be taking over the rest of this little town. So it's very, very exciting, and we've got a great lineup. So it's going to be a lot of fun, and we're very excited to meet a lot of you all. So that's going great. Remember the Holiday Inn, and you can get more information by uh, going to the website, openminds.tv or ufocongress.com. Also, I did want to say a couple of thank yous, too. We were on uh, the Mastery and Mystery radio show for KKNY Seattle this weekend with the host, Gary Mance. He's great. He was a lot of fun. He had us on for about 15 minutes to talk about the Congress, and then he had uh, Stanton Friedman uh, on with uh, Kathleen Martin. And I listened to most of that interview. He was a great host, a really good interviewer. Uh, comes up with a lot of really interesting stuff, and, and he's a lot of fun. So that was a great show, and we're looking forward to meeting them at the Congress. They're going to come out and do a live show. And I also wanted to say thank you to some friends in Tucson, Rick Keefe, who hosts uh, the Cosmic Chronicles, and Tom and Kathy and Morello, who produce it. Cosmic Chronicles you may have in your hometown, in your public access. This is a public access show on the paranormal. They send this throughout the country, and uh, so check your public access to see if you have it. Um, so we were on that show, myself and Antonio, talking about a lot of different uh, UFO subjects. And they're going to send that to us in a week. And we, they said we could put it up on our YouTube. So we'll do that for free for everybody to watch. So that was a lot of fun. And I wanted to thank those guys. And then on February 5th, I'm going to be on Eye in the Sky with um, D. Andrews. Uh, she's a lot. Lee Andrews. She's a lot of fun. And no, it's D. D. Andrews, <laughs> and uh, she's a really neat lady, and uh, she'll be doing some interviews at the Congress as well. So that is everything to look forward to in the near future. All the stuff we're serving up, let alone everything else we do on our website, such as the daily UFO news headlines, where we take headlines from the conventional media all over the world and put them on our website so you can keep up to date. And then we, we go even a step further and we bring on the excellent, the knowledgeable, just all around wonderful guy, Jason McClellan, the Open Minds news correspondent to tell us about the news on Open Minds Radio. Hello, Jason. Hello, Alejandro. And greetings, everyone. This is your Open Minds News Brief for Monday, January 17th, 2011. Our first story tonight is about a mysterious phenomenon. Residents from several southern U.S. states reported seeing a bright flash of light in the sky last Tuesday night, just before 9 p.m. Witnesses in Ridgeland, Mississippi, recorded the unusual flash on their home security cameras. Some astronomers are saying that the light was caused by a meteor that struck near Poto Mountain in Oklahoma. The CBS affiliate in Little Rock, Arkansas, reported that the light flash was seen from Oklahoma to the Florida Panhandle. Several witnesses reported seeing a ball of fire in the sky that was described as emerald green with a red-yellow tail. This green fireball made its appearance just one day after NASA released a Hubble photo of mysterious, uh, a mysterious giant green blob in outer space. I doubt they're related, but it's kind yeah. of interesting. Not related, but the, the green blob is yet, yet again another huge mystery. And, you know, this is something that they were, were talking about with uh, Kathleen and Stanton on that show this weekend. All the things that scientists don't know, just like we were talking about last week, and this mysterious here again, this green blob out in space. They don't know what the heck it is. We hear about this stuff every week. Mm -hmm. They talk about these enormous things in space. They have pictures of it. They know it's there. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what it is, though. Yeah, they act like they have it all figured out when they don't know nada. That's right. Yeah. Well, and, you know, there's the speculation that NASA or whoever else, um, that's one of the reasons that they haven't acknowledged extraterrestrial life or something because they want to make it seem like they understand everything, and obviously they're not yeah. going to understand everything there is about extraterrestrial life. Mm -hmm. But as we've seen, I think people 
have come to expect, and we're we're prove this every week that they don't know everything, mm -hmm. and they're admitting that more and more. Yeah, it's not about little things like well, I guess it's not a little thing. A green blob in space yeah. is pretty big, but still, th I think the the idea is the same. I don't know if today's world is more cynical or just more realistic, but I don't think many people believe that the government or the military or conventional scientists really have it all figured out. I'm not sure. You know, and it could be, this is something interesting to think about, is just how prevalent the idea of extraterrestrials and, and UFOs, other life, how prevalent it's been in television in movies and things for children so they grow up with this and it's been this way for a couple decades now and now repeatedly movie after movie hollywood is releasing alien themed movies geared towards children mm -hmm. and there's one coming out this year in march that actually deals with abduction yeah in a children's scary. movie mm -hmm. that's a scary topic but they're introducing this to children and I don't know why, but... Were you going to talk about that movie? Maybe you can tell them what movie that is and... and no, I wasn't, but I can. It's a, yeah. a Disney movie that's coming out in March, and it's called Mars Mars Needs Moms. And the theme of the movie is Martians are looking at Earth, and they see mothers and their motherly behavior with their children, and they decide, we need that on Mars. We need mothers to mother our, our babies. So they abduct the mothers from Earth. And then I guess an Earth boy goes on a mission to get his mom back from the aliens. But hmm. it's just fascinating that a Disney movie, a children's movie, is yeah. addressing the topic of alien abduction. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It could be that you know children are being introduced to these ideas at a younger age. And it's so possible. the idea of extraterrestrial life isn't that strange to them. Yeah. Who knows? Although, you know, I really see it reflecting back um, as these are just things that our generation's interested in, and our generation are the people out there making those cartoons and stuff right now. So no doubt if we were to make a TV show or cartoon or multiple, we'd have a lot of alien-themed ones. That's true. That's true. Aliens or another dimension are the most likely explanations for some crop circles. That's according to... Lou Grube, a retired astronomy professor from the University of Wisconsin River Falls. At the Midwest Farm Show in La Crosse, Wisconsin last week, Grube delivered a presentation on crop circles. He admitted that some crop circles are obviously created by pranksters, and as he said, including one group especially that's kind of like organized as they go out, creating crop circles for the sport of it. According to La, La Crosse Tribune, Grub became fascinated with crop circles in the late 1970s and early 1980s, but last year was his first time visiting the mysterious circles when he joined a tour group led by crop circle researcher Barbara Lamb that visited eight circles in England. That's interesting that people, when they want to see crop circles, they go to England, but I would like to point out that crop circles appear everywhere. Yeah, although you in abundance in England in that's the summer. That's true. So. That's true. But it was interesting also in this in this story that uh, La Crosse Tribune posted that uh, this professor did bring up the fact that you know, Wisconsin has crop circles. Yeah. But it this is very interesting that a college professor is talking about crop circles being created by extraterrestrial life and in such an odd setting at the Midwest Farm Show. Yeah. Pretty cool. I mean, I think, you know, it goes back to what we were just talking about. This, These, I think, are the real indicators of people's true interest in this field. Maybe conventional uh, media and science doesn't pick on it, up on it so much, but you can really see how much interest there is when these websites, uh, you know, whenever a news person puts up a story about UFOs, um, stuff like that, how they get really popular. Ancient Aliens is a huge show on History Channel. Um, whenever they post news stories, especially like Leslie Keen or th the more credible ones with military people, they become really popular on websites. I think that shows that, you know just how much the interest is. And this is another example of yet another scientist who is involved. Sure, there aren't scientific organizations involved with UFO research, but there are individual scientists in these various fields who are interested 
and they're open to the idea. And I would like to point out that this particular professor um, isn't just a scientist or uh, you know a professor of biology or some loosely related discipline. He's actually a professor of agronomy, mm -hmm. and that's actually the, the science that looks at uh, ways of producing food and, right. and plant genetics and mm -hmm. things like that. The exact type of scientist you would want to have looking into this sort, sort of thing. Right. So he is, I guess, what you could call an authority on yeah. plants and how they should behave. And yeah. so it's an in interesting to hear from a guy like this about crop circles. Mm -hmm. And I believe he actually gave the same presentation two days in a row hmm. at this, uh, this farm show. So that's pretty cool. I have no idea how well it was received, but mm -hmm. good for him. I think that's really yeah. cool. Here's another. Hopefully you got a lot of yeehaws. Probably. Yeehaw. Probably. On a related story, a major business forum hosted by the Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority will feature a panel session that discusses extraterrestrial life. This is another example of an odd placement for uh, <laughs> talking yeah. about ET. But the name of the forum is the Global, the Global Competitiveness Forum, and it takes place next week. But why would an international business forum feature a ses session about aliens? The title of the extraterrestrial themed panel session is Contact, Learning from Outer Space. And here's how it is described on the event's website. Psychological and sociocultural assumptions and preconceptions constrain us to a large extent and shape our views of the universe so that we are inclined to find what we are looking for and fail to see what we are not. Using knowledge gained from research in the fields of ufology and the search for extraterrestrial life, what might we possibly learn about hindrances to innovation in other areas of inquiry? UFO expert Stanton Friedman will be one of the speakers at this panel session, and that's not surprising given the topic of reverse engineering and alien, re reverse engineering alien technology is likely to be discussed, an issue that would obviously affect economic competitiveness and other featured speakers at the extraterrestrial panel will be astrophysicist Dr. Michio Kaku and Nick Pope, who formerly ran the British government's UFO project. It's so extremely exciting. And then Jacques Vallée is there. He is. But he uh, isn't on the alien panel. He's just, uh, he's a businessman. He's a venture, venture capitalist. capitalist yeah. So, and yeah, the, all of these, these are like big time dudes. I mean, this is major business in Saudi Arabia. Uh, where it's being hosted, people from all over the world. I mean, talk about the money that all these people have. And they're, they're have being briefed on UFOs. It looked like at the website they had an interest in technology. Right. And um, kind of like Bob Bigelow's interest, who is running NIDS and stuff and working with MUFON, that they can glean some technology, that they could build some cool stuff to, you know, back engineered from UFOs or from observing UFOs. Just it, it's really cool, this one. And like you said, I mean, this is a major conference. Major business people from around the globe are going to be there. Mm -hmm. Britain's former prime minister, Tony Blair, is going to be there as one of the key speakers. Yeah. And this conference has major companies s as their sponsors. I mean, w any company, you could pull the name out of a hat, and they're probably a sponsor to this mm -hmm. thing. They've got tons of sponsors, major companies. And they have a panel about extraterrestrial life. Yeah, pretty cool. And, you know, for this conference, you can't just go there. I mean, these are usually closed conferences where you have to be part of some organization. They probably have this tremendous annual fee that you have to pay because these are, you know, the real movers and shakers and high rollers in the world, finance and business. Um, it's very interesting that they would have it. Maybe these, of course, if you put under the conspiracy cap, you know, why do these insiders need to have this information? But maybe these aren't insiders. Maybe these are high rollers who don't have their their the um, ear or the the connections with the the government people or whoever is in charge of you know ET back engineering or anything like that. But they want to get in and they want to get their own in. And this is how you do it. If you're a businessman, you know you don't say you don't take it. You don't sit down and say you know if people don't let you in, you get in. However, you got to do it, and this is a great way to do it. Talk to some experts. Talk to a nuclear physicist. Talk to the leading cosmologist, or at least uh, publicly, with Michio Kaku. Talk to Nick Pope, who worked for the Ministry of Defense, looking at UFOs. It'll be interesting to see 
how much and if at all the media covers this event mm -hmm. and brings up the fact that they had an extraterrestrial panel. Yeah. When is this March? I believe it's isn't it just next month? Oh, is it? Yeah, it's very soon. It might be later this month, actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. The reason I ask is because, uh, of course, with the Congress coming up, Stanton Friedman and Nick Pope will be at the Congress. We'll be able to ask them about how that went. Right. Korea seems to have its own version of the television series, The X-Files. The show, entitled Special Investigation Report, is set in the 17th century and follows two UFO investigators during the Joseon Dynasty. There are parallels to the X-Files, including the backgrounds and personalities of the lead characters. There is apparently even a smoking man character in the show. And the stories in the show are apparently loosely based on historical records of strange things that happened during that time. Mm-hmm. Korean TV. I used to watch the Asian channel. Some people probably have that. And during the day, they have, like, Asian shows. And they love that, ba that period of time, like the 17th century and stuff like that. Uh, so lots of shows with the cool costumes and everything. But this is great. This is funny. It even has UFOs. I saw a clip of the trailer, and it's X-Files from the 17th century in Korea. And, you know, it's one of these old villages and this UFO flying over. Looks interesting. And this show's on a major channel. It's on the, like, number one entertainment channel in Korea. Yeah. Well, X-Files was good. Yeah. Just taking that and putting a spin on it. Well, and like much of the world, Koreans seem to have an interest in the topic of UFOs and aliens. Just last, uh, this past Saturday, a weekly investigative program that airs in Korea called We Want to Know ran an episode entitled Are UFOs Coming to Earth? where they analyzed UFO-related files released by various governments. Mm -hmm. In particular, the uh, New Zealand ones were recently released and the British files. Yep. Yeah, I saw that. The covered by the Korean Herald, I think? Correct. Pretty cool. Yeah. A recent article on Space.com pointed out that some scientists are still interested in the moon, even if NASA and others have turned their sights elsewhere. The article points out that there are still many pressing unanswered scientific questions about our nearest space neighbor. The Apollo astronauts only made brief visits to six places on the moon, and all those were near the equator. And since our last visit to the moon, satellites have discovered evidence of water reserves and other places of interest on the moon. And you and I were just talking about this recently, and it's something that's always bothered me and bothered many people, how we just sort of gave up on the moon and said, ah, been there, done that, let's go somewhere else. But we haven't been somewhere else, and we still know very little about the moon. Yeah. Well, and I was reading some of that because of this big debate. Um, I think there was another story about that where, you know, other countries are talking about going into space and possibly going into the moon. Japan might be going to the moon. Russia's thinking about it. And they think this might spark another space race to the moon. But, uh, you know, Buzz Aldrin had some comments, and I can see that the where they're kind of in trouble. They're, they've got a limited budget and then a limited amount of resources. So the decision is, do we go to Mars or do we go back to the moon? And so it's tough for them to decide. Buzz Aldrin was saying we should just do it, go to the Mars, you know, not we've been to the moon. But I don't know. I think in a long-term thinking, uh, it, it makes more sense to go back to the moon establish yourself there right. have a base there where you can go out of and that that economically in the long run would be better for you uh, you would have a lot of science that you could learn and there were a couple of people in the private industry that were saying oh yeah we have plans to go to the moon it's a matter of time because mining wise there's a lot of money to be made on the moon and right so private industry is already thinking that way and with the the recent discovery of, you know, all this possible water under layers and layers of ice, you know, the possibility of yeah. life also increases. Yeah. So. The mining part is kind of scary, though. What if, you know, I could see just because we go crazy with mining and everything, the moon just getting smaller <laughs> and smaller as they mine it away. That's what we would do. Yep. Well, that is it for the news. Remember to check out these stories and more at openminds.tv, your source for UFO-related news. I'm Jason McClellan, your Open Minds correspondent, and you've been briefed. Back to you, Alejandro. Thank you, Jason. So, some interesting news out there. Remember, you can look at the website, openminds.tv, to... Uh, 
to look at those news stories and go follow the links and check it out. And in fact, that's an RSS feed too. So if you have a website, you can put that on your website and it'll automatically update with the news. Let us do the work for you. In fact, there's a few websites out there that have that up. Other articles that we've been working on lately that we uh, might not have mentioned are, in the last week at least, Canadian government UFO website. Some people may not be aware that the Canadian government uh, not only released some UFO information, but they put up a website with a timeline that chronicles the background and the history of uh, Canada's UFO research. And it's kind of been similar to ours, slight differences here and there, um, some differences being that, you know, a lot of what they did was following us but collecting their own stuff. And their research started in the 40s, in 47, actually, too. They said that's when they started taking UFO reports because they started receiving so many reports. They didn't say necessarily Roswell was the impotence for that, but that... Um, that uh, just receiving so many reports was their Canadian uh, Mounted Police started taking reports as well as their Department of National Defense. Then in the 50s, they actually started an organized group to take and to categorize and to research those files. Um, over time, they released those files. And then some of you are probably familiar with Wilbert Smith. The website doesn't go into great detail about Wilbert Smith, a little bit, but this was a gentleman who worked for the Department of Transportation who started a project called Project Magnet. Uh, interesting enough, he started this project because of electromagnetics, and he thought, well, there's probably a way that we could use the Earth's electromagnetic field to create a sort of propulsion. Um, so we could create craft that works off the Earth's electromagnetic field. He also then saw that UFOs work very much in the same way, and he believed there was a correlation. So that's why UFOs were such a big part of his project. Um, they don't specifically talk about what some of what he found, but he found some incredible um, things from the government. In fact, he found that the U.S. was really a big uh, was into UFOs, and it was a big secret for them. But you can get like minutes from these meetings that these guys had, very interesting discussions with uh, Wilbert Smith talking about how UFOs could be extraterrestrial and making those arguments. Others, such as some of you have heard of the Avro Company, a uh, famous Canadian company that uh, started building airplanes early on, but uh, more famous in the UFO field because they built saucer-shaped UFOs that were actually used ducted fans, and uh, they didn't really work very well, but uh, these were the Avro, but it was a representative from Avro was part of this to talk about how some of these UFOs could be Russian and to argue why he believed they could be man-made technology. Even more interesting, though, I think, was uh, in the later 50s when uh, NORAD was put together, uh, the North American Aerospace um, something radar some Nor North American Aerospace Command <laughs> that's what they're called and essentially what NORAD was was a nor was Canada and uh, the Air Force getting together in order to watch for nukes coming from Russia and when they joined forces uh, they started to collect information and channel that information through NORAD on unknowns that were seen and it's really interesting that there's a poster out there and this is an official poster and actually another one of the things that you can see on the Canadian uh, UFO website uh, on this poster they have a section that talks about what you need to report they have pictures of planes and missiles talking about anything that's hostile or unidentified and they actually have a little image that says unidentified flying objects and this image is like a little rocket and a saucer, a flying saucer in this image. So this was something that went out to the military where they were telling people, hey, if you see one of these little saucer things, uh, make sure and let us know, and here's how you package that report, and here's who you sent it to. Um, they got out of the UFO research arena in the late 60s, 
But you can read more of that on our website. We, we talk about this. And you, then you, we have links back to the Canadian UFO website where you can see some of that. So I just wanted to kind of chronicle that and let people in on, on that information that's out there. Otherwise, today we just posted an interesting UFO photo, kind of an ice cream cone-looking object that was taken in 1972 in Canada. A very interesting photo. Uh, this is from the Wendell Stevens archives. So you can also read the little write-up that uh, Wendell Stevens had uh, talking about this object and some drawings that they made of the object so you can see what it looked like in more detail. So that's all on openminds.tv. Some good stuff. And speaking of good stuff, we have good stuff coming up because we have our guest, Richard Dolan, on the line. Richard, are you there? I am Alejandro. Hey, how are you? Excellent. Good. How are you doing? I'm happy to be here, man. Good, good. I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to be talking to you. I'm excited to talk to you because it's the first time I've got to um, talk to you on the air since the book came out, A.D. Yeah, it's been um, about four three, four months now. Yeah. And even right. we actually talked to Bryce Zabel before uh, the project. Right. We even knew about the project. So we had struck up a bit of a relationship with him, which is which is great. Before you knew? Before you knew about the project, really? Yeah, before we knew I, about the project. I knew that he had uh, done an interview with, with Open Minds, but I, I thought that was while we were writing the book. No, it was uh, prior. In fact, this is exciting. Um it was before the Congress, what, a year or two ago? Or was that a oh. year ago? Because I met, wow. I went to, the, I saw him at the Congress. He's like, hey, Alejandro, uh, I'm waiting for Richard Dolan, but I'm really excited. I got these projects going, and, and I'm going to meet Richard Dolan for the first time in a minute here, and I've got this project I want to pitch to him, and I'm talking fast because that's what he was doing. He, you know, he talks real fast. He was really excited. <laughs> And uh, wow. so I said, wow, cool, that sounds neat. And then you came over, so I excused myself, and you guys started talking. So I got to see the inception of this whole thing. Your, your memory of this is, um, this is embarrassing, but <laughs> I forget so much stuff. Honestly, it's, it's, um, it's horrible. It goes right through my head. Well, for you, it's probably a routine meeting. For me, it was real exciting because, uh, well, I'm, uh, I like you both, and it was uh, exciting for me to see that. that well, uh, it, was, it was important for me. I mean, heck, that was my, my uh, future co-author. And, yeah. Uh, but I, I didn't remember the specifics, or at least I don't recall it offhand. But, uh, yeah, so it was a lot I'm of glad fun. you were there. Yeah, me too, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Another reason I was excited about Disclosure and you guys getting into this, and you in particular, is because – I don't know if you remember <laughs> this moment. Um, a few years ago, after a MUFON symposium, we went to do, uh, we went to a dinner, and Stephen Bassett was kind of hosting it. And I had always been, you know, I always felt disclosure so complicated. How can we just say disclosure, disclosure? We have to define that, and you know, what are we going to do? What are the different ways it could happen? And I asked Stephen Bassett a question similar to that. I said, "Well, what does it mean to you? And and what are the right. different ways it could happen? How would you like to see it happen?" He didn't really answer the question, but you liked the question, and then you re-asked it in a different way, and it started up a conversation. And I was real excited then, too, because I was like, wow, look, Rich likes my question. <laughs> yeah, cool. I do remember that, Alejandro. And uh, it's funny. You know, disclosure was one of these things that I, I never really thought that I would be getting into the specifics of it, even when I started researching UFOs, dealing with the cover-up uh, with an implicit understanding that, if there's a reality to this phenomenon and if there's a cover-up, then it's really logical to ask yourself, well, one day this cover-up might end, but what might that look like? But that was really never how I, I chose to operate. But over the years, I've just moved further and further into that field. And even long before I met Bryce and before we started talking about this project, mm -hmm. um, when I look back now, over because I've got all of my old PowerPoints and my old lectures, and I can see in retrospect that I've been exploring this topic for a good solid 10 years, uh, trying to find a way um, to formulate the issues and to to try to see that future. And it really all came together in the last year when, when I wrote this book with, a, with an outstanding co-author, and we really uh, clicked. Yeah, I think it's an important conversation and one that wasn't being had, and that's why you know, later on, I think even at that same symposium that uh, or Congress that you met Bryce at, I interviewed right. you about disclosure because 
I really felt that out of uh, all of the people who I had interviewed or talked to, that you had the most to say and you had um, thoughtfully, um, you know, gone over at least some of these ideas. Um, and that's why I was really excited the about the book. And that's why I think the book is so important because it is something that those of us who talk about disclosure, 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 and all those in the exopolitics um, type of arena really need to, I think we need to be uh, more proactive and think about all of these things very hard going into this. Well, you know, uh, year after year of UFO secrecy, it, t it takes us time, I think, to, to move ahead to the next level of awareness. I mean, th think back to the 1950s and 60s when this was a brand new phenomenon. And it was uh, enough work, really, at that time for researchers <coughs> simply to uh, get their minds wrapped around the idea that there might be another intelligence here. And um, and it, I think it takes time to, to think through the, the mm -hmm. full implications of, of a reality, and that includes disclosure. So for many years, the real battle that UFO uh, researchers had when they even bothered with this was to just try to get the truth out. The truth is what we need, the truth, the truth. We know we're being lied to. We need the truth. But um, really, when you think about, you know, we, we've gone through the disclosure era, really through the 1990s, when there was a significant disclosure movement. And uh, we've gotten to a point, I think, as a, as a research community where we are finally able to ask, what, what might disclosure actually look like? Mm -hmm. In reality, not in fantasy, not as a, a utopian, you know, paradise perfection, where I think we all kind of have had this idea in the back of our mind. Oh, yeah, once the truth is known, then all of these wonderful things will happen. But really, right. when you start looking at our society and looking at the structure of secrecy and the, the possible nature of these other beings, um, it may not all be this wonderful ride. It, it could be great. It could be terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, it could be like a lot of other things in human history that are very much a mixed bag. And, yeah, one of the... Go ahead. Well, we just tried to think it through. Um, I think you, in, in your review of our book, used a phrase that I, I really thought was uh, one that really struck home with me. You said this is uh, done like a think tank. And that's really how, how we wanted to do it. We, we didn't want to just um, create this wonderful fantasy. We wanted to research the problem and think it through as a think tank might do it. You know, how will disclosure affect our society? Right, which I think is an important conversation for for um, our field to have. Uh, these are important conversations for us to go through, and uh, you know what, like you said, the different faces that disclosure could have, and maybe they're not all utopian and happy. One of my favorite, I think, probably the first time I heard you talk, you started it off with, you know, could disclosure be difficult? Um, will all hell break loose? Will people be running around crazy in the street? And uh, could there be economic problems or collapse? That could all happen, but if, it, if that's what is going to happen, it has to happen because the truth has to come out. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with you uh, uh, very much so. If I have a faith in any one thing, I guess it would have to be a faith in the, in the value of truth. Uh, what else? can one have faith in, really? Um, ultimately, as difficult as the truth might be, um, if we as a, as a society are going to become anything better than what we are currently, how can we do it among falsehoods? We have to deal with the world as it is. We have to understand truth. And it's only the truth that will allow us to um, go uh, to, to deal with the problems. If, if disclosure brings uh, brings us to an awareness of a great problem, uh, then it's better to know that problem, it seems to me, so that we can then deal with it and, and become what we need to be rather mm -hmm. than live as, as children in a fantasy world. Kind of can, yeah. taking it step by step and um, getting into the into disclosure, I guess the first one of the first areas that you you guys tackle is uh, this idea of what does the government even know? And I think it brings up the question of you know if we have uh, some of these organizations that are kind of 
banging at the door of the White House. Is that the best place to bang at the door? And could the people behind the door saying, look, buddy, I don't know nothing. You know, you're just... Well, yeah, I mean, yes and no, it is. Uh, I mean, a lot of us, I think, you know, even outside the topic of UFOs, realize that our formal government system is kind of uh, kind of a charade in a lot of ways, and and um, you know the, there's the old story of the Potemkin village. This is uh, centuries ago in Tsarist Russia. Uh, Catherine the Great was the, in charge of the country, and it was misery everywhere. And her minister of the interior, I believe, or her prime minister, was a, a man named Potemkin. And whenever the the empress would go on a on a um, a visit of the local villages, they would literally put up these. They would dress it up to make it look like it was much nicer than it was, to hide the misery and poverty that actually was there so that the empress on her boat would look out and see these wonderful-looking villages. They were called Potemkin villages. And um, why the heck heck did I say that? Well, because because we don't don't want a world of Potemkin villages. I mean, Mm -hmm. what we – oh, and our government is something like a Potemkin village, I guess, when we uh, really think about what's the actual power behind the government. Um, so in a, in a sense, though, I feel that we, we still want to, to treat our government as, as legitimate because this is the system how, it, how it's supposed to, as it is supposed to function. It's not, um, you know, if we're going to have a, an actual Republican Democratic system of government, we want to... We want to work with that system and give it a revitalization of power. On the other hand, we all kind of know that it it doesn't function like that. Why the hell did I talk about Potemkin villages? Interesting, but really kind of off topic. Sorry, but here's the hey, point. it's great. I love history <laughs> and well, and the idea of this facade. But, yeah, and but the thing is, um, there you know one of the points in AD after disclosure is that there is there's another power behind the formal structure mm-hmm. um, whether it's how you know how do we characterize this this has been a real difficulty but there's a it's a quasi government quasi private black budget oriented group of of people uh, I've characterized them in in other writings as a breakaway civilization or a breakaway group whatever they are they're they're vastly uh, they're behind and above the structure of power as it exists, and uh, they're the power brokers. But, but nonetheless, the, the president and the formal structures, the United Nations and so on, they're, they're going to be uh, the spokespeople for, for disclosure, most likely. And, and their power is still not completely nil. Uh, one of the points of AD is that there is an opportunity in disclosure for the president and other national leaders to uh, attempt to take back power in the name of the people from these uh, classified power brokers. Uh, I'm not saying that I think that it'll happen. I think it probably won't happen, but I do think that as an ideal, it's an ideal that should be stated, and there is an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Uh, The president can make a decision and say that at this point, when we make this closure, we, when we're forced into the situation of having to tell the world that this is a reality, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of angry people at the classified world, and the president will have to make a decision. Who do I side with? Do I side with the, the power brokers who put me into power, or do I take a chance and side with the people and maybe ride that? Yeah. And I think it's possible. Uh, there are always extraordinary people who will rise to certain, uh, can, who can rise to the occasion. Sometimes people can become extraordinary, given the uh, circumstance. And I would at least like to leave it out as a hope that a president, at the moment of disclosure, will say that, um, you know, we're not just going to play the, the game that the CIA and the NSA and the rest of the classified world has dictated us to play, but we're going to have a policy of openness and and let people know what they need to know. Yeah. Now the idea I want to get into this in a little bit. The idea of the breakaway group because I think that um, 
it's a, it's another important discussion that the book brings up and a discussion that really hasn't happened too much um, in detail. But um, on disclosure, of course, you get into the different ideas of some of the things that might um, motivate uh, the government to disclose. Right. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of those motivations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, for many years I've thought of disclosure as a great paradox, something that's impossible and something that's inevitable. I've always felt it's impossible simply because there's really no motivation. Once you've had a secret for 60 years, how on earth would you want, why would you ever want to, do, to reveal uh, the truth, to admit that you've been part of a, an institution that has lied uh, for generations? Sure, you could be the one who decides to say, you know, I'm breaking with that tradition. But, but really, it's, it's very difficult once you've been brought into a lie to, uh, then, to then throw it out the window. But disclosure will happen, it, and it must happen. And simply the reason is that time does not stand still. The world is, is changing so rapidly. Now, you know, the world has been changing for the past 50 years more in more years and and there has not been disclosure true but that doesn't mean that it it'll continue this way for another 50 years i think uh, when we look at future technological developments that there's a very very strong likelihood that we as a society will have the ability to ferret out and share this information with each other now, i just sit around and ask myself well at what point between now and, say, 100 years from now, uh, are we going to find out the truth of disclosure? I mean, look, in 100 years, we'll not only have computers that are as smart as we are, but they'll probably be smarter. Uh, we will be smarter. We'll probably have all types of biological and technological enhancements. We're just not going to be even remotely identifiable as the same civilization 100 years from now that we are today. And so at what point between now and then will we finally know and understand the truth, and whenever that point is, it's going to come, and I think it could be 20 years from now, it could be less, it could be more. Uh, what will cause it? My guess is that um, there could very, very likely be technological breakthroughs that allow us better communication than we have today that'll, that'll force the issue. For example, um, I think of the uh, development of smartphones in the last five, six years, combined with the advent of YouTube. Both of these technologies are about five years old. YouTube was invented in 2005, I believe, That's six years ago. Smartphones, roughly the same time. And think about the, how the combination of those two are transforming our world right now. And we're just at the beginning of that. There are going to be in continued improvements in those technologies and probably new technologies that will come online that are going to allow ordinary people to confirm, I believe, the reality of UFO phenomenon once and for all. And somehow that's going to happen. It could be a, a more advanced version of uh, what smartphones can accomplish, maybe not simply taking photographs, but tracking, uh, using a smartphone to uh, set up a, a series of uh, geomagnetic uh, tracking stations. I have a friend who's actually working on this right now. In other words, adapting iPhones to track magnetic anomalies. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so now whether that – and then have, them, have the anomalies uh, fed into like a central processing station so that you can track magnetic anomalies that may you know, go across a region or, or beyond. I don't know if that particular example will succeed, but that's, that's one example of – probably many that can that will come up over the next few years that people will be thinking of as a way to gain, you know, new insight into how to track this phenomenon. I think at some point it's going to happen. Uh, there's always something new and unexpected that comes up. Uh, Twitter, you know, during the Iranian riots of a couple of years ago, burst onto the scene. It was this new technology that uh, governments had not expected that were transformative in our understanding of things. I think, think, think that uh, there will be continued developments in that. And so something will happen in which, in which the issue is going to be forced 
on the government. And I think that's much more likely than some altruistic um, movement from within a government that, you know, when someone finally convinces the leadership, we really need to come clean with this. I doubt that, but I do think something can happen that will force the issue. What I'm excited about the public taking their cameras into space now that it's looking more and more likely that uh, sooner rather than later, uh, you know, the private industry will be flying people into space. Russia's already been doing it, and they're going to start their program up again here soon. And, uh, of course, we have Virgin and these other groups starting their projects. And if, which it does seem, and, and I would like to know your opinion on this too, it does seem NASA does have a lot of uh, anomalous video or, or pictures that they, they just don't speak to. They just don't feel like they have to explain. Um, and if they are seeing a lot of stuff up there, It'll be interesting when the public gets out there and if they start to get some pretty cool videos and pictures themselves. Absolutely, Alejandro. Uh, one of the things that has really impressed me over the last decade since I've really been looking into it are, are the numerous um, bizarre, anomalous uh, recordings that have been made in Earth orbit by NASA and also by um, the European Space Station and uh, by the Russians. Uh, the Chinese now are starting to, to record their own anomalous um, objects in space as well. Uh, on my website, Keyhole Publishing, I'm, I, I don't mean just to, to shamelessly hawk it, but I, people really Hey, that's really what these know. shows are for. Well, uh, on, on KeyholePublishing.com, I've, I've uh, kept alive the website of the late Jeff Challenger. Jeff was a researcher who lived in Sacramento. Uh, he died in 2007, and, and what he had done as he collected an enormous amount of uh, video footage from NASA and from other agencies, studied them. Uh, he did this almost full time in his home, found countless numbers of bizarre, unexplained things that happened in space during various missions, and then put them on his website. Uh, that entire website is, is at Keyhole Publishing. You can go there. And by the way, you could spend months just going through that site uh, to see everything that he collected. And Jeff did not uh, simply you know, argue that all of these were evidence of, of aliens. I mean, he was a very, very um, astute and critically minded person, but the fact is that there are so many. The objects doing a, what appear to be U-turns in space that he's got on, on the site, um, doing sharp angle turns, uh, and much, much more that all were recorded with NASA cameras and that NASA simply has ignored, but these are genuine recordings. And uh, sh certainly some of them you might be able to explain as um, crystallized urine ejected from the <laughs> space shuttle uh -huh. or what have you, whatever the NASA engineers might, might say, but uh, some of these are very, very bizarre indeed. And uh, it does seem to me that, that um, whether, whether these objects are ours or not ours, it's extremely important uh, if they're ours, and then it's proof that we do have a secret, very deeply secret component to our space program. Um, and if they're not ours, well, that's proof that there's a non-human um, intelligence or an, an intelligence not from our civilization that's got its own space program, uh, both of which I think are true, incidentally. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we're in a, we're in a very, very... Um, bizarre world. And when that right. secret comes out, that's just going to be one of many um, thermonuclear explosions, <laughs> basically, right. that rip our consciousness. Well, and I think what what seems uh, very positive, especially about, you know, some of the news we were talking about, of course, you know, so we just mentioned one possible way of disclosure, or many, um, with the technologies advancing. But it also seems, and you being hi an, a historian, it would be kind of I wonder what the leadership would do if we kind of had a, a reemergence of serious UFO research like we did in the 50s. Um, in the news, we just talked about how at this farming convention, one of the, sci the, the, the scientists there in agriculture was talking about crop circles and how he thinks some of them could be extraterrestrial. We have this major business form. I don't know if you heard of this in Saudi in, Arabia. In the 50s? In the 50s? No, this happened just recently, the farming one. Yeah, okay. But, uh, and uh, just, uh, we're ha there's a major business 
forum happening in Saudi Arabia that uh, they decided to have a ET UFO component of it. And they're having Michio Kaku, who's very open and talks a lot about UFOs and how we have to take this seriously. They're going to have Stanton Friedman. They're going to have Nick Pope. Jacques Vallée is part of this group. Um, but I, I brought up the 50s because the 50s was a period of time where you had scientists and, and serious scientific journals. Uh, you had NICAP with military people all talking about UFOs, and it was taken s more seriously back then, it seems. Um, well, what happened is that the, uh, the, the culture of ridicule had not fully right. um, entrenched itself. The uh, control over the scientific community had not been fully, fully established. Uh, it took really, by the end of the 60s, I think, that that control was more or less complete, really with the advent of the Condon Committee report by the University of Colorado, which was uh, you know, finalized in 1969. So what happened if we're able to shed um, that uh, ridicule factor? And uh, Well, what's happened it, is mm -hmm. that um, because of the Internet, the old structures of power have, have really received the challenge. Um, if you, when I look at the history, because I just, I've written now two volumes of history dealing with the UFO reality and cover-up, uh, these volumes have taken me up to the end of 1991, which was really just at the very beginning of the Internet era um, and be really before the World Wide Web existed. So um, what happened, if you look at the world, say, at circa 1985, uh, when there really was no Internet, the uh, control over the UFO topic in terms of public relations was absolutely was at its its peak. Um, there were no major networks that were taking the topic seriously at all. Uh, the academic world was certainly not. In other words, UFOs w were successfully relegated, uh, you know, beyond the pale, as it were. Now there was always public interest in it, but the public really had no way of of openly expressing that interest. There just was no avenue. There were a couple of UFO journals uh, that were done with no money. Uh, basically, they had no circulation, and, and that was that. And then came the Internet. And one of the, the fascinating things that I, I uh, tracked in Volume 2 of UFOs and the National Security State was how the Internet threw the old game book right out the window because UFOs, right from the get-go, were one of the key drivers of internet traffic from the 1980s onward. This has always been true. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, and true fact. Um, before there was graphic user interface, that is before there was before uh, porn basically became the number one thing on the internet, UFOs were one of the key early drivers of internet traffic. And, um, and we know this is true, that some of the earliest the earliest non-technical bulletin board, you know, the earliest uh, bulletin board system that was not dedicated to programming issues and whatnot, was a UFO bulletin board, and that started in 1986. So my point is that right from the beginning, the uh, voice of the people, as it were, made itself known in the Internet. And, and it took about a decade, but the mainstream – it took less than a decade for the mainstream – to respond to that with TV shows like Sightings, which started out in the late 1980s. And then uh, in the early 90s, another TV show called The X-Files, which, in my opinion, would not have been possible 10 years earlier. But it was possible because it was apparent by the early 90s that there was, in fact, a great public interest in the topic of UFOs. And, um, and in our popular culture, this, is, this has not subsided. And what's also happened is that because the Internet's become such a broad, um, all-encompassing phenomenon, it, it's gone beyond the, uh, the strict control of the major you know, networks and major media. Certainly major media is, is very powerful in the Internet, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot else in the Internet. There's this radio show, which is on the Internet. There are lots of voices out there. And so my point is that we are going to be able to see, and we are seeing a resurgence in uh, 
serious treatment of, of ufology um, because it's something that, that the people really do want. Um, I, well, of course, the public desire is one thing. What is now necessary is for serious, good, capable researchers to go out there and to show the world how it needs to be done. Uh, there are a few good people out there doing very good work. There are, unfortunately, a lot of very irresponsible researchers out there doing really poor work. That, that does not re reflect well on what we're trying to do. Uh, there is no shortage of people making these absurd, ridiculous, embarrassing predictions um, or you know, drawing uh, conclusions based on you know, little to no evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and these things, unfortunately, do get play in the media. But yeah. but there is a serious element to ufology, and what is needed is for for people to uh, step up, have some courage, go out there, and and do their best to um, present this the way it deserves to be presented. Yeah, I think there was, you know, like you mentioned, and, and reading your books and following that trend, um, I often go back to some of those old uh, ARPANET and like you talked about the early internet um, when people started talking about UFOs because at that point some a lot of scientists also seemed to kind of come out of the closet and be talking on these bulletin boards and you see it saw some credentialed people um, that were interested in UFOs it seems there was an evolution where you got an abundance of these people like you talked about more irresponsible mm -hmm. researchers but uh, and so you saw kind of people going back into the to their closets, but I think now hopefully we'll uh, we do see and we'll continue to see more people coming out and feeling more comfortable to talk about um, their interests. Well, I think so. I mean, first of all, the the world of academia is itself going through very significant changes uh, financially. I, I really see the the global academic community is. Uh, is primed for a market correction in the sense that uh, these universities are pricing themselves so astronomically out of, um, mm -hmm. out of any kind of sensible market. There's something that's going to be changing, I think, in the American academic world within the next decade or so. I just don't see that any way around it. We've got a combination of serious economic hardship in this country. We've got universities that costs more than uh, most uh, low mid-range houses. Right. Uh, it's, it's just not possible for people to buy. On top of that, in, in the world of the Internet, it, it's, it is really possible for people to gain a, uh, a realistically a technical education that is not far removed from what you can get in a university classroom, and in many cases better, so that realistically – the university world itself is going to have to go through. The only thing that the universities have going for them right now is simply social status, mm -hmm. uh, and they milk that. Of course, it's it's a social networking thing. You go to college, you meet people, um, you get that degree, and that's proof that you've attained the status. But that's only going to go so far in a world that's that's going through such dramatic changes as our own. Another 10, 20 years, I think the university world itself is going to be radically different. And that will have some kind of effect, I'm sure, on many, many, many uh, other things in our society. And I think it will affect the UFO question as well. I mean, right now, the university world is, is so uh, rigidly mm -hmm. uh, opposed to discussing UFOs as a reality. But I don't, I don't know how that's going to pan out in another 10, 20 years. I think there could be big changes. Yeah, well, I, not, there is this... Well, it gets difficult, of course, when uh, with everything being so um, profit-driven, uh, even cancer research gets often gets uh, put on the kind of the back burner if it's not something that is profitable. Um, and unfortunately, of course, UFOs is not seen by many. Bigelow is someone different, uh, some of these business guys, but not seen as something that could bring in a profit. Um, Almost a decade ago, I wrote an article that I'm still proud of. It's called um, Science um, Science and Ufology, I believe. It's on my website. If you go to Keyhole Publishing, you go through uh, articles, 
by me. It's one of the earliest ones, I think from 2001 to 2002. And my point was that there's no, I mean, what science is, we, we, have, we have a very idealistic view often of science, uh, at least I grew up with one, which was this idea of science being uh, this detached search for truth, use a scientific method to find things out. But, of course, what science is is an industry. Uh, you can't do science without a lot of money. It requires funding from sources. And in our world, um, in the United States, most of those sources are government. Um, most university departments must rely on government funding to do their research. And so what they really do is bidding for some powerful player. Now, if you uh, go on the realization that the UFO topic is one that is classified within the United States government system, then clearly it's very easy to see that there's not going to be any public funding for the UFO topic uh, as long as UFOs are not allowed to be discussed in the public venue because of national security concerns. And so that any research on the UFO topic is going to take place secretly in the classified world. I, I came to that conclusion back in 2001. And there's really, you know, I don't see any reason to change that conclusion. So in the university world, there is, there, there is never going to be under the current system an open research um, program that's that's genuinely and honestly going to try to get to the bottom of the UFO topic because there's no funding for it. There won't be funding for it because it's not part of the national security priorities for this topic to, to get out into the open. In fact, quite the contrary. That kind of is a good segue into talking about the, the idea uh, of the breakaway group, which I think is um, interesting in that uh, I agree that... Um, there could be this group of people who are essentially in the know. And uh, if this is a group of people who know about um, the things that have been hidden from us for the general population for decades, they have to have their own sort of culture or a different right. certain lifestyle uh, and perspective than the rest of us and what these people might be like. Right. Well, I, I have some ideas on this, and I'll be the first person to admit that even though uh, I sort of formulated this idea a couple of years ago in, in Volume 2 of, of my history and then really expanded on it in, in AD after disclosure, I'm still, I'll be the first to admit that I don't have proof that this <laughs> exists. What I have is, is a theory. Now, I do have what I think might have been in the course of my own personal investigations um, I might have I might have bumped into this group in my own research. Uh, I I think that that's possible. And, but uh, what I think has happened is, you know, think about it logically. Consider that there's a classified program to study uh, UFO technology. If you imagine that this happened, I think that this happened. Um, if that happened, then then this is a group that, with enough money and secrecy and intelligence put into it, is going to come up with some technological breakthroughs of their own and some scientific breakthroughs. Some of these breakthroughs could easily be used to uh, make money. You know, you improve your um, known technology. You find a way to improve your integrated circuits or develop fiber optics or uh, lasers or any number of other practical things that make great investment opportunities and money and that also fund the military industrial complex. It's also possible that you come up with developments that are literally too good to be shared with that world. For example, if you developed a true form of anti-gravity, a true form of what is known as field propulsion, you might not be able to share that with the world because frankly it would imply the reliance on maybe an alternate source of power something that's not pet, uh, petroleum. I mean, if you've got a non-petroleum-based uh, source of power here, then, then it could very easily be decided that this must not be shared because it would threaten the um, petroleum-dominated infrastructure of planet Earth. 
and uh, that this would threaten too many established um, you know, power players. And so what would happen, it's not that you would stop studying anti-gravity. You would just take it deeply classified, and you would employ that technology for the highly classified reality of the presence of extraterrestrials, and it would only be used for that. It would not be used for the um, for the ordinary human infrastructure of you know, fighting wars in Iraq or Afghanistan or elsewhere. You wouldn't use it for that. Um, rather, you would use it for more deeply or um, deeply classified pr projects, like perhaps going off-world and dealing with these non-terrestrials. I think this has happened. Uh, this is at least my, my theory. And if that's the case, if you've got this group that is employing radically advanced technology, um, which quite logically could, could enable breakthroughs uh, into yet other things that we can't even imagine, mm -hmm. then not only do they have a different, much more advanced level of technology, but they've also developed probably insights into the reality, into reality itself that we don't have. If, for example, they're dealing with some of these non-humans, at least occasionally, they would have a very different cosmology. So in a lot of ways, I think it would be a different civilization, and I call it a breakaway civilization since they've broken away from our own. But that doesn't mean that they live 24-7 uh, um, in this other world. I, I don't think that that's probably how it works. I think that they live in this classified world for weeks or months at a time, but that they have family. They've got mothers and fathers. They've got sisters and brothers and cousins, and they, they do deal. Uh, with the world that you know you and I live in, but they they live in both worlds, as it were. Uh, they have uh, just like any kind of military person who's dealt with some very uh, difficult um, to assimilate classified information. They just can't share it with uh, their family. I think the same is true with these with these individuals, mm -hmm. uh, except that it's even more extreme. The things that they know are even more more difficult to share. I do think that there's probably a high percentage of them who get uh, really psychologically damaged uh, before the end of their careers. Uh, it very well might be that they are considered security risks upon retirement and either uh, either forced to live in some kind of um, isolated situation or they're just damaged goods by the time that they're uh, they're ready to come out. I think that that actually is very possible. I, I had a conversation years ago uh, with a lady who worked in the U.S. military. She was a, did classified missions back in the 70s and 80s. And I don't really know what those missions were, but I do know what her debriefing was in 1982 out of Okinawa. She described it to me. She said that it was through three phases uh, for debriefing. Phase one was just ordinary counseling, as she called it, where she would sit across the desk from the debriefing officer and it would be a kind of a let's get your story straight session. You know, you didn't do this, you did this. This is what you're going to tell the world you did. You didn't, uh, you weren't involved in assassinations of these people. You were involved in this other thing. Stage two uh, was when she was forced to take sodium pentothal and be subjected to, as she called it, hostile interrogation, whatever that meant. I'm sure it wasn't fun. Uh, then there was a third stage. And of course, the whole point of stage two is to find out if she were tortured, what she would what she would reveal, right? Uh, stage three was more severe still, in which she was taken to a room with uh, men in civilian clothing and uh, forced to wear this metallic helmet attached with wires, by wires to this machine, and they somehow scrambled her head up. Now, this was uh, a story that I got in the 1990s, before my first book even came out. And... Um, you know, talking with this lady, she was a very intelligent person, but there was something that wasn't right. Uh, I'd ask her questions, and, and there would be this extra delay of a few seconds before she would answer. There was something that was that had happened to her, and I think that what she told me was true. So my point is this. That was – I don't think she was part of a majestic, you know, black ops breakaway civilization. But I asked myself after I met with her, how widespread is this in our military? maybe more widespread than we think. And, and so when you're dealing with heavily classified operations that are that literally would be explosive uh, if they were to be known in the world, 
I've got to think that these people get really messed up before they get de- um, discharged into the world because they're too much of a security risk. Yeah. You know, it it, it really reminds me of, uh, for some reason, and I hopefully I can clarify the, the connection, um, when Tony Blair got in trouble for presenting an American student's paper uh, to the government on a, an outline of Iraq and its um, military capabilities and things like that. And to me, it would make sense that the reason that was done is when you've got so many lies out there um, and you've got so many mm-hmm. se- or secrets, you can't have one of your guys write it because he's got so many secrets and, and things he's got to be careful of. It's like, you know, walking on eggshells that uh, when it would be much easier to take someone from the public who's only been given information to the public uh, to write a report because that way it's already sanitized. Um, it's mm-hmm. almost like that, th- this world of secrets that these people live in uh, where it's, it's I, I often think of how would they keep things straight, you know? <laughs> And Good question. Well, Blair Blair is absolutely uh, very much read into everything. Uh, he's been on the inside, uh, groomed for success uh, for a very, very long time since he was identified as as really uh, going to be one of the spokesmen of uh, for for the ruling elite, and that's what he's always been ever since. Mm-hmm. That's all he's ever been, and that's all he ever will be. All due respect to, respect to Mr. Blair, that's what he is, and that's his job. Uh, so I don't think anything these people do is by accident. They, uh, it's all intentional. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a very good point. Yeah, it also reminds me of, like, presidential papers and the RAND Corporation, you know, with all these think tanks, um, which actually alludes me to a question to you. Uh, what if, then, one of these breakaway groups came to you and said, you know, we would like you to be part of a think tank for us? But because you're going to be read into so many secrets, um, you're not going to be able to write for the public or your information's not going to be able to be public-facing anymore. What would you say to that? Oh, God. I've never been approached in that <laughs> regard. Um, well, I've been approached by, by people and groups who have wanted me to sign non-disclosure agreements of various types. Mm-hmm. I've declined them, actually. Yeah. Um, so, so far, I've been able to, to keep myself to myself. Um, you know, in uh, the history of ufology, there was an example back in the 1970s and 80s exactly. of a researcher who was who was seduced in exactly this way, mm-hmm. and that was William Moore. Right. Uh, Moore, during the late 70s and through most of the 80s, was the the darling of ufology. He was the go-to guy, and and um, he's sort of forgotten by a lot of the younger people in the field. But mm-hmm. he was the bomb, and and more than sort of uh, disgraced himself among ufologists by admitting that, in fact, he had been working, uh, collaborating with the intelligence community, uh, feeding some uh, questionable information to, um, to the rest of the research community while trying to, uh, to get inside information from the intel community. And um, for myself, no, I, I really can say pretty confidently that I would never – uh, I would never agree to withhold my information from from the public. I mean, what I am at this point is a guy who writes for the public. Um, I have a pretty good idea of, of what's going down, and so I don't really think that they're going to tell me something that's going to completely rock my world at this point. Uh, they might confirm things to me. Uh, it's always nice to have confirmation, I suppose, but I don't really want confirmation that much, not at the expense of, of gagging me mm-hmm. uh, as a public figure for the rest of my life. That's not going to happen. Well, I always think of that. I think that the uh, William Moore offer, um, I, I kind of sympathize with the guy. I mean, think of if you were in his shoes, mm-hmm. and uh, I've asked this question of other people, and some would take the deal he took, you know. Right. I, d- I think he was... Um, kind of taken himself you know i don't think they were honest with him but uh well it's i just personally think some of the information he got was legitimate was mm-hmm. genuine there's a lot of there's a backlash against more these days and you get people in the research field to say 
the whole thing was, uh, you know, a work up by the intelligence community, and the whole thing was BS. I don't buy that. I don't think that was true at all. There are a number of documents that Moore received that um, that I do think were legitimate, um, and even some that were supposedly tampered with. There's one that's the so-called Aquarius document, just uh, tampered with in the most insignificant way, as far as we can tell, changing NSA to NASA on this one particular document. It's the only change that anyone's aware of. Um, so in other words, I think Moore did actually get some some pieces of information that were valid. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is, uh, I have sympathy for him, absolutely, when, when you uh, think that you've got an opportunity to kind of work your way, navigate your way through the inside. Um, but I, I think, I mean, I like to think that I know what my, my limits are and what, um, what I wouldn't do. And what I don't ever want to put myself in a position of doing is uh, engaging in deception in mm -hmm. any way with, with the public. Never. Yeah, unfortunately, I also am curious about some people, um, and I think it may have happened that Moore possibly wasn't the only person um, who's been approached um, like this and who took the offer. And there could be people right now uh, who we know of who are un working under some sort of deal like this. I believe that that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, anyone who thinks about this is going to develop their own suspicions about who's who. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate because you don't want to be suspicious of, uh, of colleagues and people that you consider your, your friend. Um, I suspect that there are a number of, of such people that I've come to know and come to really like. But uh, the thing is, I try to, to separate uh, personal relationships from professional assessments and one of the real difficulties I'm going to be having as I uh, continue to work through Volume 3 of UFOs and National Security State is uh, dealing with that because a lot of the people I'll be writing about are people that I'm, I'm uh, close to. Mm -hmm. And maintaining objectivity is, uh, is, is tricky. It's difficult. Uh, we're in a field that's very, very argumentative with itself. Uh, people instinctively take sides on all kinds of issues and uh, I have no doubt that when that third volume is done, it's going to be covering the last 20 years of UFO research. Um, I have no doubt that there'll be people who'll be very angry with me mm -hmm. <laughs> over what I've decided to, um, you know, where I've decided to lay my judgment down. Speaking of the third I'm volume, I'm not sure where that'll end up. <laughs> yeah, it's always difficult. I think the best that uh, a lot of the very professional people, and I think a lot of the people. Um, you know, understand what you're trying to do. You're being objective, and that's fair. And um, because that's what I s try to stick to is what we're trying to do here. Um, yeah, but no one wants the objectivity to to work against them. Exactly, which is unfortunate. But it's just that's what where it gets sticky. Um, where y I know you struggle, and and people struggle when people want you to come down on one side or the other when you when you can't. Um, <laughs> Telling the well, my, my defense is, uh, one, I, I've learned, I've had to learn how to be slow, not fast, <laughs> in coming to conclusions. Yeah. It's really important. Uh, we, we live in an era where we're tempted to, to come down immediately right. on, you know, every new, um, every new controversy that arises in our field. And it's like every week there's some new thing. And, and the temptation is always there. Mm -hmm. For us, in our own minds, to lay that gavel down and to and to just know. And, and the fact is, knowing the truth sometimes takes years. Right. And even then, it's incomplete. And and um, uh, you know, you never want to weasel out of out of uh, something that's important. But you also don't want to make a premature conclusion because you then yep. once you do that, you're stuck with it. I mentioned it earlier in the show uh, as well, and it's always something I really appreciate about your work is that um, you're not afraid to live in that gray area where it seems like, unfortunately, it's a big problem with conventional scientists. They want to have the answer now. You know, dark matter is one that I bring up. You know, astronomers uh, say, oh, dark matter is out there. And the public gets the idea that this is something that's real, but it isn't. It's something that 
astronomers actually argue over and there's no proof and they're still trying to decide what that is there's a lot of gray areas but in conventional yeah. science as well as ufology a lot of people want to be on the black and the white and make their determination and you got to be somewhat bold to be willing to stay in the gray and well, say i don't know uh yeah thanks i um i think I, i'm not trying to uh, to brag overly much here but i'm i'm a very um i'm very secure in myself as a person um, my mother always joked with me. She said, "Richard, if you only had a little bit of self-confidence, you could really go places." <laughs> but I've always—I remember being five and six and ten years old as this little kid. Um, always with a very strong sense of who I was. It's—it's it's a blessing, to be honest with you. Um, I've been lucky with that. And what that's allowed me to do is—I—I I don't really feel a need. Um, I don't have an insecurity that forces me into having to come down and make a decision every single time. I'm comfortable enough with myself, truthfully, that I can live with uncertainty. And in fact, um, one of my very favorite books is a, is a Zen Buddhist book called Comfortable with Uncertainty it's mm -hmm. by a, 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 a Buddhist nun uh, named Pema Chodron. It's a it's a book everyone should read, to be honest with you. I'm mm -hmm. uh, comfortable with uncertainty. It's about not having to to uh, live a life that's got, you know, absolutely made in in uh, cement convictions that uh, never can be changed. Because the fact is that our world is fluid, and um, and we're fluid, and and our knowledge is always imperfect. So right. uh, being a fanatic about anything is usually a bad idea. Right. Well, we're almost out of time, and what a great note to end on. I did want to ask, when is the third book coming out? Well, that's a good question. Um, I've been saying for a couple of years I think it will be out by the uh, well by the end of 2012. <laughs> I think that that's, that's actually still possible. And, great. Um, for a little while, I was, ki I was kicking around the idea of doing a revision of Volume 1 before I went back to Volume 3, mm. but... Um, don't do that. Because the fact is, I did. I finished that first volume almost a decade ago, and, and there's been wow. so much new research uh, that I really do feel ultimately I would like to incorporate into that book. But um, honestly, I'm having issues with, with the publisher of that book. Uh. And um, I don't, I'm just, uh, rather than work out a deal uh, with them and have to get past a whole bunch of legal issues. Um, I'm just going to go and, and do volume three, and, and I think that's probably what more people would be interested in anyway. Yep, I can't wait for it. And I know there's yeah, many, got, many uh, people you know, that feel that way. The, the, the third volume, I think, um, I think will be, at least within within our field of ufology, it, it should get a fair amount of attention. Everyone's going to be mentioned in it. Everyone who's anyone in UFO research will probably be mentioned in it, and they'll want to read it if for nothing else than to see what Dolan has to say about them. <laughs> right. uh, but but what I want to do is to be fair and and not really even to focus on the people, uh, it, but rather to focus on the phenomenon itself and to focus on policy. Well, we've um, got to go. We are it, out of time. Thank wow. you so much. I know it flies by. Uh, it thanks really does. For yeah. being on the show, Keyhole Publishing, Keyhole Publishing, not Keyhole, KeyholePublishing.com right. like is the Keyhole. website. Of course, you could Google Richard Dolan, and uh, you'll be able to get there, so you could get information about the books and all of that. You'll also be able to purchase the books at the Congress because you'll be speaking there and, and present there to sell and sign books. Oh yes, absolutely. So that's going to be a lot of fun. It looks Looking like we're going to have a huge crowd, too. I mean, the response really? is great. Yeah, we've sold out, if you haven't heard, now two hotels. We've got a third hotel. So t send people to the Holiday Inn if uh, oh people are asking for space. So we're taking over this posh town outside of Scottsdale. It's going to be a lot of nice. fun. That's, that's, that's fabulous news. Yeah. So thank really you so impressive. much for being on the show. Thank you very much, Alejandro. It's always a pleasure, man. Pleasure is all ours. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. So we are out of time, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for listening to the show tonight. Next week, our guest is Jeff Willis. He runs a website called uh, UFOs Over Phoenix. He's been on several television shows, most recently Fact or Faked, 
where they went and tried to reproduce one of his UFOs and they got their own UFO footage. So we'll talk to him about that and a lot of other cool stuff. Join us next week. Thanks for listening to Open Minds Radio. Don't forget to visit openminds.tv for more UFO news. Talk to you next week.